Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today we're going to be unboxing the 2024 Microeconomics FRQs. This is set two. Uh, before we get into it, I want to remind you, uh, I don't work for the College Board, so I don't know for sure if these are the answers. These are my best guesses just from seeing the questions today uh, based on my knowledge of economics. Uh, so I want to pre, uh, uh, let you know that I really thank you for all of your support of ReviewEcon.com. Uh, make sure you let your friends know about ReviewEcon.com, both the YouTube channel and the website where there's all kinds of games and everything. I appreciate you from, for supporting this channel and purchasing the total review booklet and all of that. Uh, also, if you don't mind, if I'd appreciate it if you still continue to like and subscribe uh, to help out the algorithm. And let's go ahead and jump into it. These are my best guesses, right? Again, I don't know for sure. We'll have to wait till the rubric comes out to know for sure. And I, and I do sometimes miss questions occasionally. Maybe I don't hit the rubric. I didn't explain exactly what they were looking for. You never can quite be sure, but you can miss questions uh, and, and still get a five. So don't panic if you didn't hit every single point, right? Let's go ahead and take a look. First of all, we've got uh, Arzea. I'm not exactly how to sh how, how, sure how to say it, but Arzea Pharma has a patent, a legal barrier to entry on its newly developed eye treatment that cures common eye problems. Arzea Pharma is currently earning positive economic profit and is producing the profit maximizing quantity of eye treatments. Uh, we're going to draw a, this is essentially a monopoly. We're gonna draw a monopoly graph and uh, label it as it tells us. There's my answer for that. There we go. Uh, we're going, we have the downward sloping demand curve, marginal revenue below that demand curve. We've got our MR equals MC quantity, and then we are priced all the way up to the demand curve. Uh, the average total cost curve is below the demand curve at the profit maximizing quantity, and that shows that it is earning positive economic profit, and we have to shade in the uh, consumer surplus. There it is right there. It's from the price all the way till you hit the demand curve and then up above till you hit the demand curve, creating that triangle right there. All right, on to the next part. Uh, on your graph in part A, we're going to show the revenue maximizing quantity. Remember, marginal revenue is the change in total revenue. So as we continue to produce more units, as long as marginal revenue is positive, total revenue is increasing. But as soon as that marginal revenue curve intersects that X axis, that is where total revenue is maximized because new units being produced will have a negative marginal revenue and that means total revenue is now decreasing. So let's go ahead and label QR right there at the intersection of the axis and the marginal revenue curve. All right, on to the next part. At QR identified in part B is the demand for eye treatments, elastic, inelastic, or unit elastic. I think we could have a consistency point if you label the wrong quality quantity, but based on the marginal revenue curve being zero, that means that the demand curve above, that is the unit elastic point of the demand curve above. At higher quantities, uh, we would see it would be inelastic, and at lower quantities, it would be elastic. All right, on that graph, we're going to show now, oh, now we're assuming that uh, uh, Arzea Pharma engages in perfect price discrimination. Remember when they do that, that marginal revenue curve that we have is actually going to disappear and our downward sloping demand curve will be a demand and marginal revenue curve that's downward sloping. And then they produce at the demand equals marginal cost point there. So that'll be both the price of the last unit produced and the quantity that is produced. So I'm gonna go ahead and label that price here for CI, there it is, P2. It's at the uh, demand equals marginal cost point. All right, there we go. And that's the price of the last unit if they uh, perfectly price discriminated. And it happens to be the lowest price they'll charge. All right, what would happen to consumer surplus? Explain. Remember when they are perfectly price discriminating, they are charging every single uh, consumer the maximum price they'd be willing to pay. That means the answer is consumer surplus will be eliminated. It'll be zero. I don't know if just decrease will be enough. We'll have to see what the rubric says. Because each unit sold will be uh, sold, each unit will be sold for every price along that demand curve until you hit marginal cost equals demand. That means each unit will sell for the maximum price consumers are willing to pay for that unit. I know I, I was kind of wordy here. I'm just trying to make sure I hit the rubric just to make sure I get those points. All right, on to the next part. Assume instead that Arzea, uh, oh, I think it's Arzai. There you go, Arzai, there you go. Oh, well, Arzai Pharma's uh, patent expires. What will happen to the demand for Arzai's pharma tre uh, Pharma's treatment? Uh, will it become more elastic? Uh, 
become less elastic or not change, and we're going to explain. So if the barrier to, uh, to entry is eliminated, we're gonna have firms entering the market and offering substitutes. That's the key mechanism here. So the answer is actually going to be more elastic because the removal of the barrier will cause entry Firms will enter the market to seek those profits that, they're, that they are earning, uh, and they will offer substitutes. I think as long as you have that term substitutes from firms entering, uh, I think you should be good. All right, on to part, or on to number two. All right, we've got, this is an interesting question here. Uh, so we have uh, this table, it shows the long run production, short run production function for low end feline, and they're a profit maximizing firm, and they produce cat food. Low end, feline, uh, low end feline sells as many bags of cat food as it wants at the market price of $10 per bag, and it hires as many workers as it wants at the market wage of $18. Essentially, they're selling and hiring in a perfectly competitive market. Low end feline's uh, fixed cost is $90. We're going to calculate the average fixed cost of low end felines if they hire six workers. Go ahead and look on that table, and you can see that at six workers, we have 30 bags of cat food being produced. You take the $90 of fixed cost, divide it by the quantity being produced, that gives us an average fixed cost of $3. Now, make sure you showed your work, there you go. Uh, now we're going to assume that labor is the only variable input into low and feline. We're gonna calculate the marginal cost if low and feline increases output from 27 to 30 units. This is a tricky one because this is the first one that I can remember where we've actually needed to divide by quantity to find marginal cost. So remember, marginal anything is the change in the total divided by the quantity. But most of the time, almost always, this is actually the first one that I really remember, maybe there have been others, uh, where the quantity is actually increased by more than one. So uh, if you look on the table, going from uh, five workers to six workers is how we move from 27 to 30. And the worker is the only variable input. So that worker costs $18 and we get three more units produced. So we're gonna take the change in the total quantity produced of three, 27 to 30, and then we're going to divide by, uh, we're gonna take the $18 that the worker costs and divide by that change in quantity. So it's the change in, uh, in the total, uh, uh, in the marginal change in the cost, which is, uh, $18 and dividing it by the change in the quantity. And there we go, which is $6. On to the next part, when the hiring, uh, with the hiring of which worker do diminishing marginal returns sets in, set in? Uh, and we're going to explain using numbers. So if you look at the changes in the total quantity of cat food produced, just keep looking at the change in the total product and that tells you the marginal product. As long as marginal product is rising, then uh, diminishing returns hasn't set in yet. We have increasing marginal returns, but as soon as it starts to decrease, that is where diminishing return sets in. And so if we take a look, I ended up doing three. I don't, you might, you might only need to do, uh, you might only need to do the second worker and the third worker, I'm not sure, but I ended up doing the first, second, and third just to make sure we show that it's increasing. So I put three because the marginal product of the first worker is five, show the math. Second worker is seven, and then I show the math, and then the marginal product of the third worker is six. So that marginal product starts to decrease with that, the hiring of that sixth worker is why, right? There we go, on to part D. Determine the profit maximizing number of workers low, low in feline will hire. Explain using marginal analysis. Remember, marginal analysis is key here. If you didn't, you, if you were looking at total, total cost versus, uh, versus total uh, revenue and stuff like that, that's not gonna work. You need to do marginal. So we're looking at marginal revenue product versus marginal resource cost or marginal factor cost here. So I, here's some, uh, some marginal revenue product calculations already done for us. This is the, uh, the uh, marginal product times the price of the, of the product, which is $10. And then I go ahead and explain. It's seven, by the way. So if you look on the marginal revenue product there, you can see that it's $7 because the marginal revenue product of the seventh worker is $20, and that's greater than the marginal resource cost of 18. But the eighth worker has a marginal revenue product of 10, which is less than the marginal resource cost of 18. So they would actually lose $8 by hiring that worker. All right, on to the next part, part E. In the long run, a rival company, Gato Food, increases its production from 40, 40 units to 50 units, and its total cost increases from $600 to $900. Over that output range, are they experiencing economies of scale, diseconomies of scale, or constant returns to scale? And we have to explain using numbers. First of all, I'm gonna do the calculation. We're try trying to calculate here the average total cost. So we're finding the average total cost of the production at 40 units and at, 90, at 50 units. And you can see that the 
average total cost goes from $15 up to $18, and that means we've got diseconomies of scale. That average cost is average total cost is rising, and that is the diseconomies of scale portion of the long run average total cost curve. So diseconomies of scale because the average total costs increase from 15 to 18 as production increases from 40 to 50. All right. On to number three. Backpacks are produced in a perfectly competitive market that has no externalities. The provided graph shows the market supply and demand curves for backpacks in the country of Jumbo. Calculate the total economic surplus. Remember, total economic surplus is from the price. It would be $90 here. Then you drop down to the supply curve to get producer surplus, up to the demand curve to get the consumer surplus. Add those together, it's economic surplus. So I'm actually calculating the area of that giant triangle there. And I'm going to show my work. It's 16 units. And then I'm finding the gap. It's $120 between the highest price and the lowest price over there on the axis between the two curves. It is 16 times, uh, times 120 times 1 half. And there you have it, it's $960. Um, here we go for this next one. Uh, we're going to decrease the price, uh, to decrease the price of backpacks, backpacks backpacks, if I can speak, for, uh, for students. The government of Jumbo has decided to set a price ceiling of $60 per backpack compared to the market equilibrium. Will that quantity of backpacks purchased increase, uh, decrease, or not change as a result of the price ceiling? And we're gonna explain. All right, so I drew in the price ceiling there. All right, so uh, there we go. It's going to decrease, by the way. Um, and because at that 60, you know, you might, it, the question is kind of confusing because it says how many will be purchased, right? And you can see the quantity demanded is 24, but only eight are being produced and you can't buy more than, uh, than people are willing to produce at that low price. So at 60, uh, at 60, uh, then we've got, uh, at $60, eight is all that's gonna be produced. So decrease is the answer because the price ceiling will decrease from the quantity supplied, will decrease the quantity supplied from 16 to eight and consumers cannot buy more than is produced. All right, on to the next part. Suppose instead the government of Jumbo provides a per unit subsidy of $30 to the sellers of backpacks. We're going to identify the price paid by consumers. Now remember when we have a per unit subsidy, it's going to shift, this is on seller, so it's gonna shift the supply curve, and it's going to shift the vertical distance of that uh, subsidy, of that per unit subsidy. So it's, and each box, as you can see there, is $15. So we're gonna shift down two boxes worth of distance. So I'm gonna draw in a brand new supply curve minus the subsidy right there, and we can see the new equilibrium price is $70. So that's my answer, 70, uh, $75, not 70, excuse me. All right, on to the next part. Uh, suppose instead the government, oh, uh, we're gonna calculate the total cost of the subsidy now. You can see that we have a new quantity of 20 and, uh, and uh, the 30, $30 is the price. So we're actually just gonna multiply it. It actually happens to be that box. You didn't need to know where it is, but it's the 20 units that are now being produced times the $30 and that's $600 worth of uh, expenditure for the government. On to the part C triple I. Does the per unit subsidy cause deadweight loss to increase, decrease, or remain the same compared to the market equilibrium in part A? Explain. Uh, so here we go. There's the deadweight loss triangle there because uh, as a result of this subsidy, we're actually going to be overproducing. The allocatively efficient or socially optimal quantity is actually 16 there. We're not there, so we've got deadweight loss, all right? So here's my answer there. We're going to, in it's going to increase, the deadweight loss is going to increase because the market will be producing more than the socially optimal quantity of output. $20, 20 units is greater than 16 units, right? Uh, and really there was no dead weight loss when we were at equilibrium, all right? And and there you have it. That's, that's my best guessed answers. Um, uh, well, how do you think I did? Put it down in the chat. I might not get a chance to respond to some of these, que uh, to any questions you have, because I'm gonna be busy over the next few days uh, well, with, with uh, Mother's Day and the macro questions. I'm gonna try to make macro review uh, videos over those FRQs as well. But once again, I thank you for supporting ReviewEcon.com. Really appreciate it. Y'all have a great rest of the year. Uh, see you next time, thanks.